And um, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Trudy and she can talk a little bit about AARP. I would be happy to do that. I just put a quick note in the chat to see how many folks were joining us today uh, based on the AARP Virginia invitation. And it's a lot. And I'm delighted. And I'm delighted that they took advantage of the invitation and delighted that LLI Nova allows us to share uh, some of their programs. So I'll be encouraging them to check out the LLI Nova website to see what other programs they have available um, and to consider membership with the group as well. I'm Trudy Murata. I'm a volunteer community ambassador with AARP here in Northern Virginia. And from our earliest beginnings, AARP has always championed lifelong learning. That's why AARP Virginia is thrilled to be collaborating with the Lifetime Learning Institute of Northern Virginia to bring our members a sampling of the rich programs offered by them each semester and encourage you to consider membership with that organization as well. For more than 60 years, AARP has been a wise friend and a fierce defender helping individuals ensure that their money, health, and happiness live as long as they do. And AARP has earned a reputation as a wise friend and fierce defender through the trusted information tools, advocacy designed to protect the health and financial security of older Americans and empower them to choose how they live as they age. By promising to act as that wise friend and fierce defender, AARP is helping people who are 50 plus and their families feel confident, in control, and secure as they age. AARP helps you protect yourself and your loved ones from fraud through our Fraud Watch Network. Get healthy, stay healthy, care for loved ones, make connections, plan a trip, learn new technologies, attend a class like these classes and have fun, just like what we're doing here today with the Lifetime Learning Institute of Northern Virginia. So I hope you'll continue to take advantage of these opportunities and more. Thank you for sharing the programs with us and I'll turn the program back over to LLI. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Trudy. My name is Derek Malice and uh, I am the uh, current uh, president of our uh, Northern Virginia chapter. So I welcome uh, now 139 participants, most of whom are AAR uh, folks uh, to this session. Um, and uh, I wanted to uh, let you know very briefly a, a few things about LLI. We think uh, we're one of the best deals in town and uh, we certainly would welcome uh, any of the AARP participants today uh, to join us. Uh, for uh, uh, an annual fee of $110, uh, our members are, uh, uh, are, have access to approximately 130 classes over the course of a calendar year. Uh, there's a combination of live uh, and Zoom classes. Many of the classes are one-offs, uh, simply one topic, a 90-minute uh, uh, presentation with uh, time for Q&A, but some of them are multi-part uh, programs such as our great decisions class, which is a eight or nine week ongoing discussion of the political issues of the day. So uh, among the three uh, legs of the stool for uh, LLI members are the continuing education, the socialization, and the travel. And some of the advantages, some of the benefits of LLI membership that I'm mentioning have a different uh, fall into different onto different legs of that stool or or to a different uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, of weight. Uh, along with the classes, um, we have uh, several special interest groups that meet on a monthly basis. They include bridge, photography, a mystery book club, the tabletop games, our foodies and friends group, and favorite books. And I'm currently looking for a leader for a seventh uh, SIG or special interest group, which is our financial development, uh, excuse me, our financial discussion SIG. So if you have some expertise in that area, don't need a, uh, to be an expert uh, and might be interested in participating, please uh, contact me and I'll give my contact information uh, as soon as I finish. Um, I'd also like to talk, uh, one of the uh, 
advantages of an LLI membership is your ability to participate in what we call our cultural excursions or participating in different visual and performing arts presentations. For this session, I think we've got about eight of them scheduled. They include uh, the Silkwood, uh, excuse me, the Silk Road Ensemble at George Mason University on the 29th, a fellow traveler's opera, which is sort of about the Red Scare period in the 50s, also at George Mason on the 2nd of February. We have Syncopated Ladies on the second, uh, excuse me, on the 25th of February. The Metro Jazz Orchestra will perform on April 8th. Garden Week will feature a tour of the uh, uh, the grounds and mansion at uh, uh, Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden uh, outside of Richmond. Uh, that is on, I believe, on uh, April 19th. We have, a, on the 29th, we have two uh, activities. We have an afternoon tea, and we have what's called uh, Indigenous Enterprises, which is songs and dance of Native Americans. Uh, and finally, on May 3rd at Mount Cuba and Winter uh, Thor in Delaware, we have a, a visit of the gardens and trails and uh, mansion there. Uh, so finally, uh, we, we, I had mentioned travel. Uh, for the first time since before the pandemic, we have planned, we are planning our first trip abroad. Uh, our Jewels of Ireland trip will be from Mar uh, May 14th to May 28th. Uh, we currently have a dozen or so people enrolled and are looking for additional LLI members. Uh, AARP members would be invited, your families and friends. This will be a trip that will cover the entire periphery of, of Ireland, hit all the uh, spots of historic and cultural and, uh, and visual uh, beauty. Uh, and uh, we would certainly welcome you to, uh, to join us on that trip. So if you would like information about the trip, any of our classes, or certainly about LLI membership, please feel free to contact me. My email address is DerekMalice at gmail.com. I think my first name is on the screen, D-E-R-I-C-K. My last name is spelled M-A-L-I-S. And that is at gmail.com. And I'll certainly be able to tell you more about any of these programs, direct you to somebody who can, and uh, give you more information on how to register. Registering is very easy. Uh, our, our website is uh, very user-friendly. And we are at lliNova.org. So welcome to uh, A our AARP members. And I'm looking forward to uh, an exciting program today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tom Plews. And, uh, and on with today's program. Thank you. This is Tom Pluis. I'm I'm really proud to be able to to introduce to you Dennis Derdaski. Uh, Dennis has provided a, a one course to us each each uh, semester, and this time uh, we've selected a really interesting topic uh, having to do with a, a molasses flood in in, in Boston. Um, uh, you I think you'll find it interesting. I want to introduce him now. Dennis, are you available? Right here, can you hear me? Yes. Can you see me? I cannot. Okay. I can. Um, okay, well, let me, uh, uh, let me just uh, try you to share. You're on. Okay, I'm up. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Derek, Trudy, and Tom. I appreciate the invite here. It's always a pleasure to speak to LLI Nova. And now with the uh, increased net uh, cast this morning, the uh, AARP people. It's kind of interesting that uh, well, when you included uh, AARP, I got contacted by somebody who I hadn't uh, had contact with for decades. So I wanted to give a shout out to the Eater Moreau's, uh, hopefully who are tuned in this morning. Um, well, let me attempt to share my screen right now and see how that goes. Okay, let's see. Okay, do you see the uh, the slide? Yes. Okay, good. I have a I've lost my cursor here, so uh, 
<laughs> uh, I'll just have to live with that. We'll, we'll go on. Okay. Uh, I like to uh, give a, a number of talks. I, I pretty much operate as a base of operations at uh, University of Mary Washington Elder Study in Fredericksburg. And I like to talk on the topic of what I call vernacular history. And uh, that my definition of that is twofold. It's basically uh, the history of the every, everyday things we take for granted. And also I like to uh, dredge up things that are forgotten in history. And this is a case of the latter. It's an event that was pretty much forgotten. Uh, I first learned of it a number of years ago when I was visiting my daughter, who at the time pre-pandemic lived up in New York City, and they happened to be putting on a, a play at North Broadway Theater up there on this topic. The play did not get a lot of good reviews. It did not last long. I did not see it, but I, the topic, uh, I, got, I got drawn into the topic, basically, and I thought it would be a good elder study talk. And it's basically about a molasses flood. And uh, it occurred about uh, January 15th, 1919. I originally gave a talk at Mary Washington on the 100th anniversary of that flood. And at that time, there were a flurry of small newspaper articles. Uh, uh, New York Times ran one like this day in history, you know, uh, that resurrected the topic a little bit, but then it's been forgotten again. So it is a... Uh, a topic that I think merits uh, some more attention to us, and we'll hopefully try to give that uh, e attention uh, this morning. Uh, again, I just want to check, am I coming through loud and clear? Yes, you are. Clear. Okay, good. Uh, now, they say that newspapers are the first draft of history, and uh, the day after this uh, flood occurred, the Boston Globe ran the following headline, which is not exactly accurate. It, it wasn't probably an explosion in the true sense of the word. And it actually ended up killing uh, 21 people uh, eventually when all the numbers were counted. But it was a very big story up there. And it was a story that hit a number of newspapers initially and then faded away uh, pretty quickly. Uh, if you look at human history, one of the things we as a, as a species have to contend with from time to time are floods. And most all floods are water floods. Uh, the, uh, you know, of course, you, you, if you've read the news recently, they're going having some troubles in California right now uh, in certain areas with flooding. Uh, this is a picture of the great jo Johnstown PA flood uh, of 1889. Uh, again, a, a water flood. Uh, I'm going to make reference to a, a, a brief reference in this talk to a flood of another fluid uh, that occurred in England. Uh, but uh, when you're dealing with other types of fluids, the nature of the flood becomes different. Just imagine what a molasses flood must feel like. I mean, uh, I would never want to die in the flood, and I certainly wouldn't want to die in the molasses flood. Now, what I'm going to do for the next few slides is uh, uh, go over some background. Um, I am a retired electronics engineer by profession. And one of the things I had to sit through in engineering school is a three credit course in uh, fluid dynamics. And since I had to sit through, I'm going to have you sit through a few slides there, but don't worry, it's not too bad. And then we're going to go into a little bit of the history of molasses, what molasses is, how it's figured into uh, American history, and particularly history of the New England region, and why there was this big tank of molasses in the middle of Boston. Uh, that, uh, that ruptured and caused this big flood. So let's start out with a little fluid dynamics uh, right now. We're gonna talk a little about the topic of viscosity. Um, basically all liquids aren't created equal. Uh, you've probably noticed yourself that if you pour water out of a beaker, it uh, flows very free, freely, but if you pour honey, it takes a little while to flow. And that's uh, a process and a um, uh, cold viscosity that causes that. And uh, there are different types of viscosity. Uh, in the early days, uh, you, well, you can probably remember some of you uh, who are in our age group, uh, if you grew up in the 1960s with no clunker of a car that burned oil, you used to go to a hardware store and buy this product, which really was a viscous fluid. 
I remember uh, having a friend of mine pour it in their car up in Long Island on a 16 degree night, and it took about five minutes for the can to empty out. Uh, there are other types of fluids around. Here's another one that's used in the automotive area. That's anything but viscous. It actually bounces around and beads all over the place. So if you ever use this, you probably get more of it on yourself than on the uh, substance you're spraying it on. Uh, another uh, such fluid is mercury. Uh, as a kid, we used to get a hold of mercury back in the 1950s and play with it, you know, thinking of how the danger of that is right now. But mercury tends to, uh, it wants to beat up and bubble and just trickle away, uh, is anything but viscous. So you have these wide range of uh, fluid characteristics that, you're, that you deal with. Um, also, too, when you talk about viscosity or, or the slowness of flowing of a, a fluid, it's usually affected by temperature. The colder a temperature the temperature is, the, um, the slower the fluid flows. Now, here we have a case of a woman adding oil to her engine, and this is probably done on a warm day because the, the oil flows uh, very freely as she performs this maintenance task on, uh, on her engine. Um, initially, they would uh, measure the uh, viscosity of a fluid by a, a device called a viscometer. Uh, you can do it digitally these days, but what a viscometer did was it had a, it was a bent tube with a couple of bubbles in it and you fill the tube up, uh, particularly the first bubble on top between the A and B, and you measure the time for the bubble by C, near C, to fill up. And the longer the time it took, the more viscous the fluid was. And that was a way you could uh, uh, basically quantify uh, the viscosity of, uh, of fluid. Now, let's go to a few household uh, uh, items that we have in our kitchen and talk a little bit about how viscosity affects us uh, on the everyday level. Here is a picture of a substance uh, which I, we're going to call a liquid for the purpose of this talk. It's actually a suspension uh, called mayonnaise or real mayonnaise. Uh, I mean, have you ever wondered when you go to the supermarket, you go to the condiments aisle, you see real mayonnaise, but you don't see real ketchup or mustard. I've always been a question in my mind. But you probably have this, uh, this substance in your kitchen. And likewise, you probably have this substance in your kitchen too, honey. And these are both viscous fluids, but they're different in their viscosity. And uh, that's because there are a couple of different types of viscosity. And these, the two types are pouring viscosity and kinematic viscosity. It's important to understand the difference between these two to understand this Boston molasses flood. Now let's go back to our mayonnaise and honey. If you try to pour, if I open that jar of mayonnaise and try to pour that mayonnaise out of the jar, it will not come out very readily. The best you can do is probably squeeze the plastic jar and get a few blobs of it out. Uh, which is to say that it has a very high pouring viscosity, but if I pour the honey, it'll come out slow, but it will still pour, unlike the mayonnaise. So we say relative to the mayonnaise, the honey has a lower uh, pouring viscosity. But let's, let's take a chopstick. And if I insert a chopstick into that jar of mayonnaise and stir it around, I don't get very much resistance. It's pretty easy to stir that mayonnaise with a chopstick. So we say the mayonnaise has a relatively low kinematic viscosity. You think of a kinematic viscosity as a stirring viscosity. If I take that same chopstick and put it in the honey and try to twirl it around, I'll get more resistance. So the honey has a higher kinematic viscosity. Mayonnaise, low pouring viscosity, excuse me, high pouring viscosity, low kinematic viscosity, and opposite for the honey. I want you to try to keep those thoughts in your mind because it'll affect how molasses flows when we finally uh, uh, speak about the actual um, uh, tragedy that day. I'm going to skip this chart because we don't have a lot of time this morning. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing you have to realize, there's two types of flows of fluids, turbulent and laminar flow. If you turn your kitchen faucet on uh, on a very low level, you find the, uh, the water comes out very smoothly in almost like a sheet. Uh, 
But if you really turn the, uh, the spigot up, uh, and in particular, you'll find this on your outside water spigots uh, for your garden hoses, it'll come out in a very turbulent fashion. Uh, uh, not a lot of uh, organization to the flow of the water. And we normally associate this turbulent flow with more pressure, more force that the water is exerting. Um, so you have to remember too, there are two types of flows uh, in this case. Um, and it's kind of interesting when I gave this talk four years ago, the first time after I finished the talk, somebody came up to me at the, uh, at the lectern and said, you know that, uh, that chart on turbulent versus laminar flow? That's almost the exact same conversation I had a month ago with my urologist. And I said, well, I'm sorry to have to bring the topic up. <laughs> I have had brought the topic up. But anyway, so the two types of flows, two types of viscosities. Now, the other thing you have to remember, and we'll be almost over with this in a couple of slides, is something called momentum. And uh, when I showed you this picture of turbulent flow, a good example of turbulent flow is white water. If you're in a white water raft or kayak or something, and you see that turbulent flow, you almost know that there's danger there because it telegraphs to you that there's a lot of momentum. Momentum is mass type velocity. It's the force of the water on you. Um, if you see a very calm brook, it may not sound as threatening. This is one of the reasons why anytime after a big storm, they tell you never drive into standing water because it may not be standing. You may have this hidden momentum in there which can give you uh, uh, troubles. Um, another way to kind of uh, to show momentum is you've probably seen these little devices. They're called Newton's cradles. Um, they were very popular in the 1970s. I think anybody who is starting out in life uh, in our generation, you know, graduating from college and having your first apartment, usually you found one of these things on the coffee table as a tchotchke uh, uh, to uh, elicit a bit of conversation or as a conversation piece. And of course, if you operate things, uh, these things, you have, uh, you set one of the outside balls in motion, the momentum of the ball hits the middle balls, but what happens is those balls don't move. The force from that is transmitted through the balls to the outside ball, and it uh, goes through a very repetitive transformation back and forth. And it's a real good example of the sinister nature of momentum in a water flow or in a large flood. The water may not seem threatening, but there's this undercurrent of force there, which you don't see, which could actually you know, uh, hurt you, do damage, and get you caught up in, uh, uh, in the flow of the, of the water. So uh, something to remember about besides viscosity and the two types of flows is that uh, water or any kind of a flowing fluid can present, if you have enough of it, sort of a hidden threat. Uh, to you in uh, terms of hidden momentum uh, that can push you away or actually destroy uh, structures or items. Now, okay, I promise you no more fluid mechanics. Let's talk a little bit about taste. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the visceral pleasures of life, uh, being able to taste food. And one of the more pleasant tastes, especially if you're young, is the taste of sweetness. Uh, if you're a child and you have a high metabolism, you sometimes crave sweetness. Uh, most people, as you get, get older, crave it less. Um, and of course, uh, it has its, its role in metabolism and providing the energy uh, for, uh, for different types of uh, animals with high me metabolic rates or, or, young, uh, or young people. So, Sweetness is one of those really desirable tastes that people have been after to capture all through uh, uh, human history, but it wasn't always available readily. Now, in this country, uh, we have sweetness available in many forms today. You can go to the supermarket and pick up cane sugar. Uh, you can even get fructose uh, that you know appeared by maybe the last 50 years. It, uh, became a, a way of also adding sweetness to our foods. And then also artificial sweeteners, which mimic the, uh, the, the taste of sweetness. So we are uh, surrounded by all sorts of ways of getting this element into the taste of our food. But that wasn't always the case throughout history, uh, particularly in American history. Um, 
generally the uh, earliest sweeteners came from cane sugar, but cane sugar is usually has to be grown, the sugar cane excuse me, has to be grown in uh, warm climates. Uh, in, this, in this country, probably most closely around Southern Louisiana. But in the early days of the country, one of the ways to get sweetness in our food was through the maple sugaring process. Now, most people think of maple today as maple syrup for your pancakes or French toast uh, with, the, with the robust taste of maple in, integrated into the sweetness. But the industry back in the early days was really aimed at not getting the maple flavor, by getting the sweet flavor by uh, refining maple syrup and then drying it out into a crystallized sugar. Uh, so here we have some pictures of maple sugar, and I love the picture on the bottom. It has to be uh, uh, a keynote for what not to do is for a safe practice, have somebody aiming a drill at somebody else through a tree. But here we have some maple sugar is up in Vermont uh, getting the maple syrup. Now, initially, maple syrup in this country was graded, uh, usually from uh, a grade A, B, and C. The most desirable maple syrup was that which had the, the smallest amount of maple flavor. Because when you dried that syrup, the motivation was to dry the syrup into a sugar. You did not want that maple flavor tainting just the pure sweetness of the sugar. Hence, the most desirable grade A had the least maple flavor. Now, nowadays, you desire more of the maple flavor of the syrup for your pancakes. Um, and until recently, uh, the grading was such that uh, grade A had the, was the, uh, was the lightest in color and the least maple flavor. Grade B had a more robust maple flavor. And grade C wasn't even sold in stores that was usually used for confectioners. Uh, and it had a extremely high maple flavor. Now, when I, up to a couple of years ago, when I bought maple syrup, I used to go for grade B. I did not want grade A maple syrup because I want the maple flavor on my pancakes. Now, now they changed it to everything is grade A uh, and it's grade A light amber, medium amber, and dark amber. Uh, I guess from a marketing standpoint, grade B has a stigma about it. Uh, it's kind of like the effect of the you know, lake in Lake Wobegon, all the children are above average. So everything now in maple syrup is grade A because right now the maple syrup industry is not really aimed at making sugar. They're aimed at ma making maple syrup uh, because we have so many other sources of sugars um, in, our, in our commerce. Now, cane sugar is where really the bulk of our sugars come from. Cane sugar was first domesticated uh, about um, uh, almost 10,000 years ago. Uh, and uh, it was crystallized into the type of sugar that we're more familiar with. Uh, you know, around uh, 100 or so uh, CE. Um, and again, it comes from warmer climes. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing about uh, the cane sugar or the uh, sugar cane is that the material in the cane is about 65% liquid, 65% water. And you do have a juice in the cane, a sugar juice. And that's what you, is used to make molasses. Now, when you process cane sugar, uh, there's a number of steps. They take and extract and squeeze the juice out of the cane and send it through something called a first boil. And uh, as the product you get from that first boil of the juice of the sugar cane is something called first syrup, or in the United States, they call it cane syrup. And you'll see it in the store, and most of the time it's clear. I have one example of it uh, colored here, and I think they may have added some uh, caramel coloring to it, but uh, it normally should not uh, be colored. Um, and uh, if you think back to the time of the uh, Boston flood about 100 years ago, our grandmothers probably would use substances like this rather than uh, granulated sugar, uh, because it was just more readily available. Now, if you take that syrup, rem reminisce that syrup and boil it again into a second boil, you, get, you can extract more of the sugars and you get a, uh, a substance, a, a liquid that's slightly bitter, 
and we call it molasses in this country. In some areas of the world, they call it second molasses to uh, represent the second boil of the cane syrup. In the United Kingdom, they call it treacle. And uh, so this is what your grandmothers probably really use more often in sweetening in their recipes. Uh, you can still buy it in the store these days, but we don't use it as much. Um, uh, just because of the readily available, uh, of readily, uh, the ready availability of other alternatives. Now, you can do one more boil uh, to this liquid and you then get the third boil, which in this country is known as blackstrap molasses. And this is very bitter, and, uh, but it still has a high sugar content. Now, what's interesting about this, when you, get, uh, when you boil this, uh, this third boil, you do get some um, B vitamins and some minerals uh, in the actual uh, fluid itself. Uh, again, a very viscous fluid. And for a while it was touted as a health remedy. You could take a few teaspoons of this a day and supplement your uh, nutrition. Very much in the days of, you remember Geritol about 60 years ago? I think if we were giving this talk to AARP 60 years ago, we would probably all have had our Geritol in the morning and we're probably going back to sleep after breakfast. Uh, but anyway, um, it was touted as a, um, uh, a, a health benefit uh, uh, for, and particularly for uh, during times when maybe like the depression when people weren't always getting adequate nutrition. Uh, I got a homework assignment for you tonight. Go on YouTube and look up a song called Blackstrap Molasses by Groucho Marx and Jimmy Durante, and you know, it's a novelty song that um, uh, kind of captures how this uh, material was used uh, 80 or 100 years ago. Okay, so this is molasses. Now, the interesting thing about molasses is that it has a high sugar content, so it can be fermented and distilled, and it's basically the basis for rum. Um, now, if you need to get a cheap uh, spirit, rum's a good way to do it. Uh, because all you have to do to uh, get alcohol out of molasses is throw some yeast and water with it, let it ferment a little bit, and then distill it. Unlike something complicated like scotch whiskey. With scotch whiskey, you gotta, you know, you have to uh, harvest barley, you then have to dry the barley, you have to malt the barley, you make, a, you make it into a beer, then you make it into a high wine, and you finally get it distilled into spirits. And it's a much more expensive process. Um, rum is a good way to get booze. And it's also a good way in the early days to get alcohol if you wanted to have use industrial alcohol. We'll get a little more into that in a minute here. Now, what's very interesting was that uh, in the late 1750s, the New England area was a hotbed of molasses distilling or rum distilling. Uh, in 1750, there were initially 35 distilleries in, Manhattan, in Massachusetts and none uh, anywhere else in New England. And uh, by the 1770s, the distilleries uh, spread uh, throughout uh, Massachusetts into Connecticut and Rhode Island. Uh, and the imports of molasses to make rum and make alcohol uh, grew about 15 fold in about 50 years. Uh, now, back then, uh, they weren't thinking too much of industrial alcohol. That came with the Industrial Revolution. This was rum. And rum had a value. Um, it was, you know, it was utilized on, uh, on ships, obviously, uh, as a incentive for the crew. But rum also uh, was part of a more nefarious um, operation. Uh, and it's been dubbed the molasses trade route. And the th reason it's nefarious is because it enters into the slave trade. Now, here's an example of a, uh, from a ship called the Sanderson, which is a very good illustrative example of the rum slave trade. Uh, let's say you start out in Barbados uh, and uh, you have sugarcane growing down there that has been transformed in molasses, into molasses. That molasses gets shipped up to the New England area. And this is like mid 1750s. Uh, where it is then distilled into rum. Um, 
The rum is then exported to Africa and used as currency to purchase slaves in the West Africa. Uh, the slaves are then transported back to Barbados, uh, where in some cases they do work in the agricultural area. And then Barbados and the general Caribbean area is a jumping off point for slaves to be exported to the Southern United States and other places. So this New England rum distilling business was part of a larger overall trade uh, structure. And again, uh, it wasn't from our perspective, um, a very positive thing, but uh, eventually the rum distilling gets moved down to the Caribbean close to the source of the molasses. And it, it's more, it gets to be made more efficient, but there was a established infrastructure uh, in distilling of molasses that was established at Beachhead in New England and stayed there into the 20th century and certainly was still there by 1919 when this uh, disaster occurred. Now, just to give you an example of the prices that, um, of, uh, that the slaves garnered in terms of rum, Generally, uh, here's an example where a male slave would cost about 115 gallons of rum. A female slave was uh, valued at a little less. Uh, but again, it was a method of exchange uh, for uh, slaves as part of this trade. Now, another thing to know history-wise, we're all familiar with the, uh, the Stamp Act and the Tea Acts and the Boston Tea Party and all of that. But there are a couple of earlier acts where the, um, the British uh, tried to uh, extract uh, funds of the American colonies, the Molasses Act of 1733 and the Sugar Act of 1764, which goes to illustrate how important sweetness was in the diet and how, uh, how established molasses was uh, in, the, uh, in the early colonies. Uh, these are less known, but uh, they were uh, nonetheless, uh, some of the first um, foundations of revolt in this country. And you can always um, rely on John Adams to come up with a good quote. And uh, he says we shouldn't uh, bless to confess that uh, molasses was really a, an essential ingredient to uh, American independence. So it was a very, uh, as a fluid, as a commodity, it was much more important than it is today, kind of like you know, whale oil was more important than it is today. There still is a whale oil industry today, but it's just a shadow of what it once was. Uh, and molasses played that important role. Now, we get into the 19th century, we get into the Industrial Revolution. And uh, the Industrial Revolution also uh, causes us to demand more and newer chemicals, solvents, dyes, lacquers, cleaning solutions. Uh, and this, these all required alcohol, industrial-based alcohol. And as I said, uh, at the time, uh, molasses was a good way to get alcohol fast. Now, some of the stills that they used, the stilling processes, weren't as sophisticated as the uh, column stills that they use today that, can have, that have a very high throughput. Uh, but uh, molasses was a cheap way to get this alcohol. And let me take a sidestep over here. Uh, how is it transported? Uh, this looks like a barrel and it can be used, uh, can be uh, it, it, this type of a structure of transport uh, has very different names, uh, butts, barrels, uh, hogsheads. Um, and uh, it was used primarily to uh, transport uh, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic goods given the technologies of the time. Um, I, I give another talk where I uh, talk about the revolution and the way we lived in our houses. And I mentioned that the advent of painting, painting houses can all be traced back, the modern advent of painting can all be traced back to the invention of the modern paint can, which came from the railroads and it revolutionized the whole paint industry in about 1850. So, the um, likewise for transportation of coffee. So the um, 
the vessels that you transport commodities in are very important in the history of the development of those commodities. Now, barrels were the state of the art um, back in the 1800s, and you had a lot of wood, and you were able to take and put straps around those barrels. But also, uh, this design was used in um, much larger vessels uh, in industrial production. And uh, I want to spend a couple of uh, charts here on the 1814 London beer flood. Uh, there was an area of London uh, in which there was a brewery that had many, many uh, large vats, which were designed on the same uh, uh, wooden structure for uh, storing uh, container vessels uh, of staves and bands, metal bands around them. But these things were a couple of stories high. Being in an industrial area, the neighborhood was a relatively poor neighborhood. It was not affluent at all. This is something that you see quite often in non-affluent neighborhoods. They're in a industrial area. And what happened in 1814 was one of these vessels ruptured. The metal band broke uh, due to the pressure of the fluid inside the vessel. And it caused other metal bands to break. And it flooded the neighborhood. Now, the problem with this very poor neighborhood, uh, it was inundated with over 300,000 gallons of beer. And um, it resulted in eight deaths. And uh, being a poor neighborhood, there are many basement dwellings which uh, flooded very quickly and, and people drowned in the beer. And um, you would think the beer flood would be a manna from heaven, uh, but at the time, you had horse-drawn carriages with horse feces on the ground and all this dirt and filth mixed in with the beer. So it certainly wasn't drinkable when flooded. And uh, there was an inquiry after the flood. The, the final determination of the inquiry, uh, the, uh, the inquiry was that it was determined to be an act of God. And hence, there weren't, weren't any reparations that could be awarded to the, uh, the local uh, people who got either injured or killed in this disaster. And it was a case where these being poor, these people just weren't empowered. Even though the brewery was not liable for uh, damages, uh, it almost went out of business because of the damage done to the actual brewery infrastructure itself. And the British government did bail it out by a rebate of excise taxes that the um, alcoholic um, uh, industry had to pay at the time. So the brewery got bailed out, but the people didn't. Uh, and it was one of these rare cases where you have a flood that wasn't water. And, but what's interesting, and I want you to remember two things, it happened in the poor neighborhood and it happened in a poor neighborhood that was very close to an industrial facility. So there's a pattern you'll see in a little bit. And those are the only two floods I know uh, that are not uh, dealing with water. Now, after this whole um, disaster, the brewery uh, eventually changed and got rid of these banded stave vessels for holding the beer. Um, but they're still used today. If you go up to New York City and look at the water tanks on top of buildings, they still make them in this manner uh, with uh, slats of wood and metal bands. Um, the so-called act of God part of this thing, I don't buy uh, as far as the beer flood, uh, because I just think that the metallurgy back in 1815 was not as sophisticated as it is today. And now we know how to design metal bands that can withstand the safety factors of loads. But it is interesting to note that there is a family up in New York that still makes these uh, 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 water tanks and they still use them on buildings, even some very modern buildings in New York. Now, let's go to Sarajevo, 1914, start of World War I. Uh, I think most of us know this story, uh, Archduke Ferdinand and uh, the, uh, he happened to have a, uh, a chauffeur who took a little different route one day, took the wrong route. Ferdinand got assassinated and precipitated the war. Now, the United States under Woodrow Wilson at the time had a policy of isolationism. Uh, Wilson did not want to get involved in this war. 
until he did. And um, however, there was a sort of a winds of war type of um, uh, type of atmosphere around that we could be sucked into uh, uh, this uh, this burgeoning war over in uh, Europe. And when we finally were, we had a very quickly established munitions industry that uh, was created. Now, for those of you at LLI who attended my talk last uh, July, I believe it was, on the Rosie of the Riveter story, you recall that I uh, mentioned that this Rosie the Riveter or female in the uh, defense workforce phenomenon was not really a function of World War II. It really occurred in World War I with the munition workers uh, who were the, let's say, the of World War II. And here we have some uh, female munition workers uh, in a plant. And if you remember that talk uh, I gave, I, I spent a lot of time speaking of uh, the fashion that these women wore in World War I. How to entice women to wear different type of clothing in a uh, industrial environment. And we see these women in their womenalls. Remember, you do not call them overalls, you call them womenalls. And um, so, they mainly were in the involved in the production of ordnance. And of course, ordnance requires explosives. And with the technology at the time, the, the explosive technology at the time, explosives requires alcohol to, um, uh, to make the explosives. And so a quick way of getting alcohol, if you remember, was through the distillation of uh, molasses-based materials. And many of these women workers uh, worked in the Southern New England area. Bridgeport was a particularly um, uh, important locus uh, for these women. And uh, it was aided by the fact that there were still vestiges of the molasses-based distilling industry in uh, the Northeast, particularly New England. So you want to have the production of the molasses-based alcohol close to where you're producing your explosives and then close to where you're packaging those explosives into ordnance. It all all sort of played out. Now, let's go to Boston and look at the north end of Boston where this uh, disaster took place. For those of you who are familiar with Boston, I'm sure you know the north end. The North End was one of the oldest settled Boston neighborhoods. Um, a number of famous people uh, emanated from this area. One, Increase Mather, who was a well-known clergyman of the time. He was the father of Cotton Mather. Cotton Mather is probably better known today than Increase was. Uh, Paul Revere, of course, you have all heard of him. Uh, it was a uh, well-respected, neighborhood of uh, bourgeois, uh, business, and intellect. But by the 1840s, it began to get into some really serious decline. And it became sort of a, a stepping off point for immigrants who were uh, immigrating in the late 1800s to the United States. The first wave was Irish immigrants who came in, then European Jews, and by the time we had this uh, particular disaster, the neighborhood was settled primarily, I'm going to keynote the word primarily, by Italian Americans at the time. And these people were not very well um, uh, ensconced in wealth. Um, many of them uh, had a, a crude uh, ability to use English, and hence they weren't very empowered. Uh, similar to the people who lived in the British neighborhood where the beer flood occurred. Now, one thing about the North End, it was also hard hit by the 1918 influenza uh, epidemic. Um, it was kind of interesting when I gave this in 2019, we hadn't heard of COVID at that point, and the uh, influenza thing was something people couldn't relate to. But the influenza epidemic had a few spikes, and then there were these echo outbreaks for a few years afterwards. I don't know, I wouldn't say similar to what we're getting now with COVID, but um, it, it was, uh, there were a few months where it was uh, uh, pretty debilitating uh, to the population. 
Now, there's a company we want to focus on right now called the United States Industrial Alcohol, USIA. And they had a facility in Boston called Purity Distilling. And again, this is one of these companies that was not really uh, interested in making distilled spirits for consumption, but they were more in the area of industrial alcohol for industrial uses. As we got into World War I, it, industrial alcohol became a very strategic commodity along with molasses. We meet a gentleman by the name of Arthur Gell. Uh, he started out in, as an administrator, uh, as many people did in the time uh, with clerical positions, uh, got pretty good in, in the financial area. He was originally hired as an office boy by Hiram Walker and Sons, another distiller. And um, in 1909, gets hired by Purity uh, and uh, he gets promoted to treasurer pretty quickly. He's pretty good. At, um, at numbers. And then he gets uh, positioned to purity in Boston and gets char uh, charged with expanding the infrastructure of the purity facility in Boston, which includes the need to build a large storage tank for molasses. Now, I also want to take a little quick detour here and just mentioned another molasses company that was in Brooklyn, New York. Um, it produced something called Sucre Sugar, which I think I remember that brand name, but also Grandma's Molasses. Now, I want you to remember this because this figures in the story later on as the American Molasses Company of New York. So you can see there are lots of molasses firms. Uh, now, this company at the time, um, wasn't involved in actually distilling the molasses into alcohol. It was mainly uh, the making and maturing of the molasses. Now let's take a look at a picture of the map, a part of the uh, north end of Boston, right on the river up there. Uh, this was a map that represents how the buildings were populated at the time. Now, unfortunately, I don't know what my glitch is here, but I do not have access to a cursor. So, um, the, we'll have to uh, do a virtual mind cursor over here. If you look at the left-hand side of this map where the numbers one, two, three, and four are, this is where the Purity Distilling Company uh, was uh, located. There's a curving uh, sort of brown structure. That is the elevated railway, I guess they call it the T now in Boston, uh, which went through the town. Uh, there are some more industrial facilities to the left of this, um, uh, of this distilling company. The area where you see the number four, you can see there was a gas, um, there was a, it was a gas company in that uh, area. The area where you see the number four is residential. There's sort of pink buildings over there. And then there's another residential area further to the right uh, with pink buildings. And um, you can see there were wharfs. So uh, this was a very good area to offload raw materials, to transport processed materials. Uh, there was a sugar company there, uh, or candy company, a merchant's warehouse. Very industrial area, but also not an affluent area. Uh, you know, people lived here because they had to, not because they had a lot of choice. So uh, we'll come back to this map a little bit later. Now. The project to expand the facility was assigned to Jeff in the, um, uh, the uh, excuse me one thing here, I want to just check something. I have a uh, typo over here, that should be Joe and not Jeff. I missed that. So uh, the project was assigned to Jell in late 1914. And um, he, can, he contracts with the Hammond Iron Works uh, to draw up plans. Um, and they come up with blueprints and um, uh, they are basically ready to, uh, to start the construction uh, very quickly of this facility to bring this much more needed infrastructure and uh, potential uh, defense capability into place. The original plan was to have the uh, tank to be completed in uh, 2015, December 2015, 
and Jill signs a, uh, a lease uh, with the construction company. Uh, in November, they start the foundation. The steel plates arrive a month later. Uh, there is one worker fatality on the thing. And the tank was tested uh, to a six inch depth of water and it was ready to go by the 2nd of January. Um, very fast process. A process that didn't allow for a lot of inspection, if any inspection. Um, and uh, one wonders about that a little bit, but it also it's done in a, uh, an area that residentially, uh, the people do not have a lot of empowerment. So when it's built, uh, here's an image of the tank structure in the neighborhood. And if you can relate to the map I showed you, the tank was a little bit north of the elevator railway. You see the elevator railroad tracks over here and some of the buildings. And it sort of dominated the landscape uh, when constructed. Now, Jell was concerned about security from the outset. In this time period, there have been a number of um, anarchist activities uh, in this country. Anarchists then were a little bit different than anarchists now. Uh, anarchists then used bombs. Um, if you go back to January 6th, a couple of years ago, you notice there was no bombs used by those people. So there was a different, a different threat by anarchists. And there were anarchists back then. There was a period in the late 1800s where anarchists really dominated um, uh, Italy. And uh, there were a few Italian anarchists who came over here and anarchists from other nationalities. If you remember that, um, Brooklyn facility, the molasses facility, they located a bomb uh, at that facility. Uh, and uh, that started, started to get people involved in the molasses business a little nervous. So Jell did hire an off-duty Boston policeman and he had some of his own people monitoring the security of the site. But I would not say that the security was tight, uh, but it was a concern. Now they noticed early on that there were leaks from this tank. Um, uh, employees that reported our odd sounds emanating from within the tank. Uh, I'm going to give you a reference to learn a little bit more about this later on, but there's some interesting stories about these odd sounds. And for one reason or the other, which I have not been able to establish, they never really filled the tank to capacity. Was it out of concern for the integrity of the tank, or was it just they didn't have enough molasses coming in on the shipments? I think it was the latter, but I can't tell you that definitively. One thing about neighborhood children is they did pilfer some of the leaking molasses. They were poor kids. Um, it's a nice little sweet treat, but they probably brought something home for their parents to use in, in cooking. Uh, so you can see the tank did not have great integrity. Now, when they pumped molasses into the tanks. Uh, they pumped it in from ships from the, um, from the Caribbean. Uh, tanker ships of the day could haul up to about a million and a half gallons, 1.6 million gallons of molasses. Now, when you load this uh, on to the docks at low temperatures, uh, the molasses would cool as it was transported from the Caribbean. And if you have ships, uh, traveling in the winter months, the outside ambient temperature would help cool that molasses down. So in a midwinter delivery uh, of molasses into the, uh, this tank, the molasses would be around 50 degrees or so. And they had to use heated pumps to make it flow. Because remember we talked about the cooler it gets with viscous fluids, the slower they flow. So in order to expeditiously get this molasses off the ships, they would heat the pumps to um, uh, reduce the viscosity uh, to make it flow quicker. Okay, war. Um, Woodrow Wilson finally changes his mind. Uh, we intercepted some German communiques uh, about the possibility of sinking merchant ships. There was the infamous Zimmerman le letter, which tried to bring the Mexicans into the uh, war. And there was a declaration of war in April, 1917. And when Wilson declared war, he didn't fool around. Uh, you recall there was something called the Sedition Act that was created. There were a lot of clamps on civil liberties. 
And this may not always have rested well with some of the anarchist community of the day. So it may have actually uh, somewhat caused more of a problem, at least a more of a perceived problem on the part of people who were worried about anarchists. Okay, July, 1917, the tank was in operation for a while. There was a record Boston heat wave. And uh, the local residents started to comment that there, was a, there were sounds coming from this tank. It sounded like it was boiling or burning or doing something, bubbling. And uh, many people uh, were concerned about this. And there was one employee, and I can't really go into the full story here because it'll probably take too long. And I'll give you a reference to it. He reported concerns to management. Uh, he was kind of blown off. So what was their solution? Well, to give people more confidence, they decided to paint the tank brown to match the molasses. Uh, you know, a perfect bureaucratic solution to a problem that in essence doesn't affect the solution. So again, concerns about the tank started to bubble up, no pun intended, uh, as early as two years or a year and a half before the disaster. Remember I mentioned the influenza epidemic. Um, Boston was hit hard. Um, by the time of the, uh, in 1918, uh, when we hit the armistice uh, of World War II, uh, there were still some residual um, uh, ep episodes and cases of the flu in Boston, uh, but it did have a debilitating effect economically on this, uh, on this neighborhood. And if anything, it caused less empowerment for these people. Now, there's another interesting effect uh, of the end of the war is, okay, if you're producing um, industrial alcohol to make explosives, now with the war ending, you're probably gonna see the bottom fall out on the explosive industry. And what are you gonna do with the alcohol? Uh, at the same time, there was a very interesting development that came up, and that was the Prohibition uh, uh, Act. Um, as one of the marketing tools for the pro-prohibitionists was that they didn't want to see the uh, young men coming back from the war, the doughboys, uh, tempted by demon rum, by alcohol. And one of the arguments they made was we uh, want to... Uh, protect our boys and not send them from one threat to another threat, from a war threat to a chemical threat, which was, will they die from drink? So what happened, as you well know, was we did get a vote for uh, prohibition. Now the actual prohibition enforcement didn't come till a year later from this. So a number of these distilleries that were um, uh, dis distilling alcohol for industrial purposes, thought that they may be able to make bank on the ability to, while you can, sell as much alcohol as possible, assuming people are gonna store this when prohibition is finally enforced, um, to make one last uh, uh, attempt at making a profit and uh, uh, garnering a return from the infrastructure investment and in all these distilled, uh, uh, that all these distilleries had invested in. So uh, there was still a demand, a still a desire to take molasses and distill it, uh, even in January of 1919. Okay, a month before that, Purity hires a boilermaker to caulk the seams uh, of the tank because they are expecting a large shipment of molasses in January. Hopefully this large shipment uh, would be able to be manufactured into rum uh, to stockpile uh, the shelves of liquor stores all around the area. And uh, in, on the 12th of January, 1919, the tanker of the Yarrow arrives in Boston and commences unloading. Um, the low temperature that night was forecast to be two degrees Fahrenheit, two degrees above zero. And uh, they successfully, through these heated pumps, uh, did pump 600,000 gallons of uh, molasses to the existing molasses in the tank. 
Now recall, I tell you that I told you that generally the pump molasses in the winter time is around 50 degrees centigrade. That tank is going to have molasses that is cooled down in the Boston winter. So that warmer molasses is going to mix with the cooler molasses. And now for the first time, the tank is at near capacity. This is something that hadn't been done before. Um, Again, uh, I, I believe, I haven't been able to prove this, it was just based on economics. They figured they could make some more profit. And it's like nine inches from the top. So the tank has now been stressed to the point where it hasn't been stressed before. At 12.41 p.m. on the 15th of January, 1919, it happened. The tank burst. Now, again, is the word explosion appropriate? Probably not, but the tank burst. To show you a little contrast, maybe about at 12.40, one minute before the tank burst, we had this image of the um, environment there. At 12.41, you had that. That was where the tank had been. Uh, and uh, within just a, you know, a minute or so, uh, the whole thing was destroyed and a large flood of molasses was released on the community. Now let's remember that, a large flood of a viscous fluid that had a laminar flow, but probably had a lot of force of momentum underneath that flow that wasn't intuitively obvious to an observer that could cause a lot of damage. And boy, it did cause damage. Here are some pictures of some of the structures that were pushed over near the elevated railway. You can see it had enough force to, um, uh, to actually warp some of the super, uh, superstructure of the elevated railway. Uh, and this is all a coating of molasses on the floor. Here's where one part of the L absolutely collapses. Uh, and again, the force through that momentum uh, uh, of that viscous fluid, uh, again, really surprised people. Uh, you can see a number of, these are probably remnants of some of those buildings that I uh, showed you near the number four on the map that had collapsed. And let's see, here's another image of uh, uh, the L, uh, which had to really be constructed. You can see a piece of the actual tank here got pushed down. I'm not exactly sure where in the neighborhood this is. I haven't been able to ascertain a map position, um, but you can see there's uh, the rivets got ripped apart on the, uh, the actual tank there. Uh, here is a very interesting and poignant story. Uh, this is a firehouse. And um, uh, the firehouse got hit pretty badly. It didn't look like it was as badly hit on the outside that it was on the inside. But uh, back then, uh, they made buildings with something called balloon construction, where you had large timbers along the sides of the buildings and the floors were hung off. And what happened here, the floor pancaked. Uh, in this building. And I think I have a closer image here. And there was one fireman who actually got trapped on the uh, pancake floor and the rescuers couldn't pull him out. And it was really a sad story because as he was trapped, couldn't be pulled out, the molasses was slowly rising. He knew he would eventually be drowned in molasses. Now think about this for a second. It's bad enough to be drowned in water. I hate to think of what it must feel like to, you know, to die in a flood and be drowned in water. But imagine being drowned in a viscous fluid that doesn't enter your lungs as quickly as, um, uh, as uh, water does and slowly uh, asphyxiates you. The only comparison I can make, uh, some of you may remember the writer um, and television personality, Andy Rooney. Uh, he wrote for the Stars and Stripes during World War II, and he has this story uh, about a, uh, a bomber returning from a bombing raid in Germany to a, his base in England. And um, the plane was damaged as one of these planes with a plexiglass turret on the front where he was in that turret uh, to steer the bombs. And he was stuck in the turret. The turret couldn't be moved and he couldn't get out of the turret. But the landing gear in the plane was also damaged and the plane was gonna have to make a belly landing on the airfield in Britain. And of course, did that, the turret would be destroyed and he would meet his death. So he had about two and a half hours to contemplate his death uh, on the plane trip back from, uh, from the bombing raid in Germany. 
it seems to be very similar to this um, story about the firemen over there. And they eventually did lost them. They gave them whatever comfort they could, but they just couldn't move the pancake floor and they couldn't do anything to divert the molasses. And it was one of the more poignant and sad um, uh, fatalities of this, uh, of this whole story. Uh, okay, let's go back to the map and try to get things in perspective. Uh, and this is kind of an animation of where the molasses flooded. Uh, if you take a look, it didn't impinge on the residential area that much. There's only that one small little area where it goes over those, uh, that pink area of the buildings. But that was enough to injure quite a few people and kill 21 people. There was a, enough of a density in population there uh, to uh, create havoc. And luckily it didn't extend to those residential areas to the right, otherwise it would have been an unmitigated uh, disaster. But this gives you an idea of the area where the uh, destruction occurred. And it was a pretty wide area. And of course, a lot of force and momentum that, um, uh, that was uh, wreaked at that particular point in time. Uh, here's some other photographs of uh, some of the collapsed houses. Uh, they just didn't stand up to the uh, force here. Uh, this is one area where the L, I, I think I showed you a picture further on down where you see the L collapse, but uh, this, uh, a lot of vehicles were destroyed and um, um, a lot of small structures um, collapsed. Um, what's interesting here, you see a picture of them trying to wash the molasses away. And it turns out that water didn't do a good job of getting rid of the molasses. It turns it, uh, when they finally used the brackish water um, uh, from the river that had a little more salt content, the salt seemed to break it down a little bit better. So uh, if you ever have to get rid of molasses, think of salt water. Uh, here's a section of a welder trying to dismantle part of the collapsed, uh, collapsed tank at a time. Okay, well, Obviously, when you have a disaster like this, there's liabilities. And um, the blame was interestingly put over here. Uh, the Chief Justice in Boston Municipal Court criticized the Boston, the Boston Building Department and the, uh, and the company. Um, but then ultimately, and this is a real interesting use of logic, the chief said the rest the blame rests on the public itself because the public elected the officials who, who uh, basically populated the inspection departments. Uh, it was a real way of copping out, I think. Um, there was a grand jury uh, empowered. Um, they were supposed to be looking into faulty construction. And the grand jury on the 12th of February, and you notice this is pretty quick from the uh, 15th of January, comes to a conclusion that there's insufficient evidence for manslaughter on the part of the company. Uh, and uh, again, I think a lot of this was due to the lack of empowerment of the residents. Uh, these people had, many of them had a very insufficient command of the, uh, of the English language uh, and didn't have a way of communicating with their politicians. Um, but however, uh, and I'm losing a, I'm losing my bottom part of the screen here, but we'll go on. So in, it, it was decided to convene uh, a, a board of investigation. Uh, by December, 1919, uh, they ceased alcohol production there. Um, and Jell himself is transferred and promoted to New York. There's no, there's no criminal proceedings against them. It's now a civil type of an issue. And in December 1919, we have the final death. Uh, the final person who got injured from a very critical injury dies uh, almost a year after the, uh, the actual disaster itself. Hugh Ogden is a up and coming uh, attorney, a um, Boston Brahmin. Uh, he was a judge advocate for the army during the war. He exits the army as a lieutenant colonel and he gets appointed to uh, sort of act. Uh, they asked him to serve as an auditor uh, 
to report findings for liability and possible damages. I think the nearest I can describe to this uh, position was if you remember after 9-11, they had a, a gentleman by the name of Ken Feinberg who was uh, appointed to make decisions on the payouts uh, of damages to people who were injured at 9-11 and they called him a special master. I think he was also the special master of the Bernie Madoff uh, clawback um, uh, scandal. I would think of this guy Ogden as sort of a special master to oversee what the liability payment should be for uh, civil damages on this. It was not really tried in a court of law. Oops, I'm, okay. Ogden decides the best way to do it uh, with the consensus of the court is to consolidate the case and not treat these as individual claims. There are 119 claims that were made, particularly on the part of the residents at the time. And uh, this is pressure from the industrial alcohol company, U.S. Industrial Alcohol, because they want to minimize their risk as much as possible. They then hire a legal expert and they mount a defense and the defense is centered on the existing anarchists that are out there. Uh, there's no way they can prove this thing as was caused by anarchists, but they tried. Uh, and they spent some money on bringing in so-called expert witnesses, uh, but they couldn't really, at least from my perspective, uh, make a uh, good case. I just have something that popped up on my screen. The host has asked you to start your video. Uh, am I? Have you lost my video? Anybody out there? Yes, we yes, have. I did. Okay. When did you lose it? Uh, just about a minute ago. We okay. Can actually, I still have it. I still have it. Hmm. I, I have, have it too. It. I have it. I turn it off. I have it, and turn it back I have it out in California. <laughs> I have it. I have it in Boston. Well, I guess the eye is heaven. <laughs> Dennis, we can we can see your screen, but we can't see you. Okay, uh, I don't care if you can't see me. Uh, but I, unfortunately, I lost my cursor on this thing. I would love to be able to click these, to get rid of this cursor, uh, get rid of the start video thing. Um, okay, if, mo if you can see the slides, that's the important thing. Yeah, and I, gather, I gather everybody can see the slides. Yes, we can see the yes. slides. Okay, so USIA, uh, they try to blame it on anarchists and it doesn't really gain a lot of traction. And I have, uh, okay. Uh, so this whole process of uh, Ogden's review of this case takes about four years. Um, uh, and they bring in a number of witnesses, they bring in a number of de depositions. Uh, and uh, he makes his recommendations in April of 1925. Um, but during this time, a few things happened. One, in 1920, there was the famous 1920 Wall Street bombing, which was allegedly caused by anarchists, in which 40 people were killed. And then there was a the famous Sacco and Vanzetti case. Uh, two people who were accused of killing a, uh, a, uh, a guard and a paymaster in a shoe factory outside of Boston, who were eventually executed uh, and were labeled as anarchists. And I think historians think now they were unfairly uh, executed and they, they did not get a fair trial. But this whole idea of anarchists was still in the, uh, the minds of a lot of people, even though they really couldn't prove this was an act of anarchy. Um, a gentleman by Damon Hall is hired to represent the defendants. Uh, he deposes uh, uh, Jell in New York, and um, uh, he really rips into Jell and uh, uh, exposes his real lack of expertise. Now, what I was going to do, I was going to read this to you, uh, and I'm going to give you a chance to, to read this briefly, because right now, my screen is partially blocked off with a bunch of uh, windows here telling me to start my video and stuff. But if you look at this, um, uh, this statement that Ogden finally makes based upon all the inputs to this inquiry, it really is an indictment of Joe. It basically says that this guy 
was clearly in a position where he shouldn't have been. He was above his head. And uh, there's a good chance that this, uh, this tank was really unsafe. I'll just give you a chance to go through that because it's a, a really interesting piece of writing. Um, Okay, and again, I apologize for not being able to read it to you, but I got windows open all over my screen right now. The estimated damages that Ogden uh, proposes is around 300K and broken down uh, as the following, which was, you know, in 1919, a fair amount of money. Uh, was it uh, uh, real justice? I don't know if you can say that or not, but, uh, the gentleman Hall, who was hired uh, by uh, the defendants, um, demanded a full jury trial and probably a jury trial of individual cases. Well, this sent shivers of USIA's uh, spine, and they immediately pushed for a private settlement. Uh, everything was sealed, but through some sleuthing, um, they somebody discovered in the 1925 financial report that they spent about 628K in settling this case, which was about twice what Ogden recommended. So at least these poor people did get some recompense for uh, their uh, injuries, uh, but uh, one wonders if it was really uh, totally justified. We'd love to see what the questions are. All right. They've got a lot of them. We're not going to have time. For okay. Uh, this is a uh, one of the death certificates, just to put a little perspective on this. That death certificate happens to be of a non Italian American person uh, by the name of Bridget uh, Clonerhe. Uh, and it uh, just brings a, a little human uh, element uh, to what people went through. Um, and it was very clearly marked as a result of the, of the flood. Now, I want to just Divert for a second. Most of you have heard probably of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, uh, which occurred in 1914 in New York, uh, uh, another tragedy. And until 9 11, it was the uh, uh, highest loss of death of uh, all New York tragedies. And it basically, were, uh, there were seamstresses in upper, uh, the upper floors of some buildings who were working on shirtwaist, sewing shirtwaist. Most of these were immigrant type um, uh, people. Uh, and uh, they were basically locked in their work environment when a fire broke out. And uh, many of these just dumped, jumped to their deaths, escaping the flames. And it was a, a, a really bad tragedy uh, of the time up there. And it got a lot of press. And, it, it's remembered a lot better than the uh, Boston molasses flood is. And if you go to the side of that building today, it's um, on the campus of um, NYU. It's about a block from uh, Washington Square Park. And the building's festooned with historic plaques commemorating this tragedy. And it's well, well recorded. And for many years, uh, there used to be a sort of a parade that honored uh, the people who died. Uh, and uh, it's well ensconced in the collective memory of New Yorkers, even though it occurred back in 1914. In comparison, there's very little commemoration of the uh, Boston uh, disaster. If you go to that neighborhood today, there's a small little park uh, that's in the vicinity. And you notice there's a wall, a small wall there and a small green sign in the wall. And the small green sign basically uh, describes, commemorates the flood that occurred in the area. Um, and they said, you know, structural defects with unseasonably warm weather contributed to the, uh, to the disaster. So even in Boston, it's not very well commemorated. And maybe it has been, excuse me, maybe it has been more so since the 100th anniversary because some people have realized that um, it wasn't treated very well in historic memory. Okay, <clears throat> why did the thing collapse? Well, the hypothesis, the operating hypothesis is that the warm and cold molasses mixed and started the fermentation process, which built up gases and pressure. In the 2014 analysis, they you know, said that if you built that tank today, you'd build it with much better steels that would hold up uh, to the pressure. 
And then um, the uh, rivets were not reinforced. Uh, and then recently, the, the guys at Harvard came up with something called gravitational, uh, gravitational currents, uh, which is something that's kind of new. Uh, and what that is, like, trying to explain that, um, if you're sitting on a summer's day and, you're, uh, and the weather outside is kind of rainy and overcast, you're in like a low pressure uh, a weather environment, and there's a high pressure front coming through, the difference in pressure will cause a lot of wind to, uh, to equalize the pressures between a high pressure front and a low pressure. This is very similar. If you have a high density fluid next to a low density fluid, you'll get some flow between them uh, to uh, equalize the densities. And the Harvard people felt that maybe this also contributed to the, uh, uh, the collapse. But you know, bottom line, uh, it was very clear that this was not built well. It was not inspected well. It was inspected not as a building, but it was inspected as a industrial structure, which was less, uh, less involved at the time. So um, there, you can see why the judge tried to blame uh, some of the uh, problems on the inspectors. Um, and uh, you know, the, the lesson learned is uh, don't put a financial person in front of a, in charge of an engineering project. Uh, and I can tell you that as an engineer, I've been to that uh, a few times. So that pretty much is my, uh, my discussion today on the topic. Uh, normally, when I give my talks, I like to recommend about three or so books to people uh, so they can learn more. And I have a hard time doing it on this one because as far as I know, there's been only one book written on the topic, and it's a good one. And I uh, did rely on, uh, on it for a lot of my information. Uh, I highly recommend it to you. It, uh, there's some areas this book goes into that I did not go into today. One, if you're a John Grisham fan and like uh, legal intrigue and uh, legal stories, uh, he, he goes into the what happened in the, uh, the dispositions, findings, and review legal review of this thing in detail. And uh, the author, Puleo, also goes into the human element. He tells the stories of the individual people with individual names, kind of commemorate what they went through. And again, if you're interested in the, the human element, and are, there are some interesting stories, human-wise. And I think that was the basis of the play that was put on in New York with the human element of this thing. Uh, you can find it. Now, you can probably find this book if you go to Amazon, use books or A books or something. I wouldn't be surprised if they had a copy up at Wonder Books in, um, in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, but uh, again, it's out of print, but a, a good read. If you want to do a little more sleuthing on this, um, there's some historical newspaper uh, sites. I highly suggest looking at the Boston Globe and the Boston Herald uh, for some firsthand reporting. And you can see how the story evolves. It's pretty interesting and how they begin to learn more and more new facts. The archives of the Smithsonian Magazine published a really good article on this about, oh, I guess seven years ago. If you go just and do a search on the Boston molasses flood in Smithsonian, uh, it's uh, an article worth reading. And the other one is the American Physical Society put a good article on their uh, website. Now, don't get intimidated about this. You don't have to be a physicist to read this article. The article is written very much with a lay person, but it's an interesting story and it, it tries to describe technically um, uh, why this happened. So I, I would send you to those sources to learn a little bit more. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to open up questions. Dennis, this is Tom Plewis. Uh, I've asked people for questions in chat. I, I don't have any questions for you. Um, I, we thank you very much. I'd like to turn this back to Derek to, to close it out and we'll end up in time. I had a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, why was it called Blackstrap Molasses? Uh, interesting. Uh, I don't know if I can give you an answer to that. I, I think there's a few um, there's a few other terms for it too, which I, I, I forgot. Uh, it, it somehow comes into the vernacular. I I don't think I can give you a good answer on that one. Uh, on the uh, the molasses historical sites I've looked at have never tackled that topic, but it may have been just a uh, a localized vernacular that hung on. Like as I mentioned in 
England, they call it treacle. They, they avoid the term molasses totally. And uh, sometimes these vernacular terms get traction. Bonnie's got her hand up. Bonnie Nelson, do you have a question? I do. I um, had written Tom to ask him um, about, uh, I understand molasses has a lot of good beneficial uh, ingredients, but it also absorbs easily like lead and things like that. And acrylamide, I think it is something like that that can be carcinogenic. So I wondered if you knew anything about how to select the best brand or form of molasses would anything like that well not being in a uh, mode of using molasses <laughs> i can't say i'm an expert in selection it's very interesting you bring that up i saw a headline yesterday that uh, was uh i don't know if you saw it but uh it listed a number of dark chocolates including uh chocolate sold by trader joe's that had like lead and some other uh, uh, nefarious substances in it. Uh, and, you know, one wonders we have food and pure food and drug laws and things like that. If certain things are missed uh, from times, I have eaten Trader Joe's chocolate before, and I'm beginning to wonder. Uh, well, it it depends on the brand, the particular one of Trader Joe's. I, I think it's a very dark or something. I read about that in um, cadmium in consumer lab that I subscribed to a few years ago and told my friends. And they all said, well, if it's not good for you, they wouldn't sell it, <laughs> which no. I don't think is true. But I do think it's more things from South America have more um, radiation type exposure or somehow or another, uh, as opposed to the Belgian chocolate and the chocolate out of Africa. Well, I do know when you process the molasses, you get, you, you, it's actually the third boiling of the molasses that gets you to the blackstrap molasses. That's mm -hmm. when you start to get more of the B vitamins come out from the, um, uh, the cane plant, but you also get trace elements. And now what I was led to believe that the trace elements that you get uh, in the blackstrap molasses are beneficial trace elements nutritionally. But who knows, maybe they also drag some of the, the bad guys with them. Uh, but uh, again, I don't use molasses uh, a lot. And uh, in fact, it was interesting when I gave this talk, I actually brought some molasses down there and let the elder study people sample the various versions. Gee, I hope I wasn't poisoning them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Lots of B vitamins. <laughs> right. The B Thank vitamins you. will counteract it. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. There, there's a couple of other questions, uh, Dennis, that I'm uh, seeing. Uh, one was, uh, how deep was the flow? And another one, I think, was uh, if you knew anything about what happened to uh, Jell after the trial, presumably, what happened okay. with his life. Yeah, Jell is interesting. He kind of fades into the woodwork. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to use this as conjecture because he was on the fast track and then all of a sudden you don't hear from him. I think the final, um, the final indictment of Ogden's summary on Jell, I wouldn't be surprised if it did him in career-wise. Uh, he just, you see nothing about him. In fact, I, I haven't even established where he died. Uh, so he's one of these guys, I think he, he was a rising star. And then uh, this probably, and again, this is again, conjecture on my part, uh, caused him to be a falling star. Um, what was the other question? Uh, how deep was the flow? Okay, the flow, uh, you can see, uh, was enough to rise to the second story of the firehouse. And that was the story where the, um, uh, the, the floor, the above floor pancake down. So if you establish that as a benchmark, uh, what is the uh, size of one story? Somewhere between eight and 10 feet. So I would conjecture like around eight and 10 feet because we did know that it got up to that story in the firehouse. Anything else? Yeah. 
Dennis, uh, not hearing anything else. And uh, since we're a little bit over our time. I Can I just say one thing? Sure, certainly. I uh, posted an article from the Business Insider where Hershey's and Trader Joe's been implicated with lead and cadmium, And then there was a scientist or some kind of doctor from toxicologist from J J um, John Hopkins. And he said, oh, the levels are so minimum. But in my personal opinion, if there's any lead or cadmium, I don't think I would be eating it, but that's me. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I'd be very wary myself. Great. Anyway, well, again, you can get the article on, the, it's on the internet, you can Google it. Great, thank you for that. And uh, Dennis, uh, thank you for a fantastic uh, presentation. There's a number of uh, thank yous and compliments in the chat room. We really, really appreciate it. Tom, thank you very much for uh, facilitating the class. And uh, uh, Trudy, thanks for uh, uh, helping with this collaboration with AARP. I'm sure glad uh, everyone was able to attend. I think I saw a number of 167 at one point attendance, which is about as high as we've ever had for a class. So uh, having, uh, having said that, uh, uh, I, I would just reiterate to uh, all the AARP members that uh, LLI Nova would welcome you as members. Uh, uh, LLINova.org is the way to go. Or if you have any questions about membership or about other classes, please feel free to email me. Again, my email address is Derek, D-E-R-I-C-K, M-A-L-I-S at gmail.com. And I'll surely respond to you. Um, so uh, with that, I'll just mention that uh, we've got two other upcoming classes, collaborations with AARP uh, uh, within the next uh, month and a half or so. Uh, on Tuesday, January 8th, one of our own members, uh, Barry uh, will do, Barry Santini will do a presentation on Parkinson's disease and insider's view. Barry has done many programs for us, and uh, this one will be of uh, uh, particular personal interest to him. So that's Tuesday, January 24th at 1.30, and then Tuesday, February 23rd, uh, 28th at 1.30, we'll be collaborating on making connections, revisiting favorites, and exploring new relations in art. Uh, Sarah Schub, who has facilitated many programs for us, will revisit some of our favorite works at the Smithsonian uh, American Art Museum and the Renwick Gallery, and uh, we look forward to having you join us then. So if there's nothing else, I think we'll, we'll call it a wrap. Well, thanks for the opportunity to let me speak to you and uh, enjoy the, uh, the nice winter day we have.